Greetings and welcome to our video on machine learning. Machine learning is becoming this huge buzzword, so in this video we're going to talk about what the technology is and both its strengths and limitations. And you will actually get an opportunity in this video to use machine learning algorithms to train your very own models. In this video we're going to be talking about the goals and motivation behind machine learning and we're going to introduce a ton of machine learning terminology. So models, instances, and features, you'll understand what all that means by the time you reach the end of the video. We're also going to talk about the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning and when it makes sense to use one versus the other. Finally, we're going to go through all the steps of the machine learning process. So we're going to you know, talk about gathering data, selecting a model, actually training that model, evaluating its performance, tuning it, and finally deploying that model in the real world. And we're going to use tools like confusion matrices in order to help us evaluate a model's performance and find out ways that we can tweak its performance or maybe improve upon it in significant ways. To get started with this video, make sure you go and ins download and install Weka. Uh, there is a link on the course website to the Weka homepage. And also make sure you grab the sample files. So in this video, we're going to be looking at an Air Force fitness test database. And we're actually going to step through everything you need to do the lab. So it actually behooves you to spend some time, follow along, and make sure you understand how Weka works before you have to do this on your own. To get started, we should talk about what machine learning actually is. Because again, like I said, it's, it's a buzzword that is becoming more and more prominent in industry and throughout the Air Force. For us, I'm going to pull two definitions that kind of highlight what machine learning is trying to do. For computer scientists, machine learning is a field that's trying to teach computers how to perform a task without explicitly programming them to do it. So, for example, if I'm Tesla and I want to teach a car to drive, I want to be able to have the computer learn the rules of driving without having to program, you know, at a red light stop, at a yellow light go, you know, slow down, at a green light go fast, you know, without teaching it all these rules because there's too many rules for me to explicitly state. You can also think of machine learning as a, a system or a way of building a model from data. So the idea is that I get a whole bunch of training data, I feed it to the computer, the computer produces a set of rules that it thinks, um, interprets that data effectively, and then as a human being I have to go back and evaluate it and say yes that makes sense or no that doesn't make sense. So if that doesn't make a lot of sense to you right now, think of it like the way that I teach you comp sci. I give you a bunch of labs and homeworks and that's your training data and then you you go through all of that and when you're done to make sure you understand it I write a test for you right and then I give you a whole bunch of problems you've never seen before and the hope is that if you could do those problems that you've never seen before you actually understand how to program you didn't just memorize the answers it's the same thing that we're trying to do with the computer so with machine learning uh, we are it is a mix of algorithms that know how to take data and produce these uh, rules data sets that are used to train the computer and verify that the computer is actually learning what we want it to. So we'll talk more about the idea of a training versus an evaluation set in a minute. And then human expertise. So um, there's a whole bunch of work involved. There's an entire major, uh, the data science major, uh, that's just coming out at USAFA that's uh, talking about how do we get the data and structure it in a way that the computer can process and actually learn what we want it to learn. And I think the reason machine learning is really becoming you know, uh, much more prominent these days is that we've always talked about the idea of computers learning, but only now are we at a point where we actually have this availability of the data and the ability to store that data, right? We can store years worth of human uh, GPS coordinates. Uh, we can store you know, every website that every person on the internet has ever been to, right? And we finally have the ability to process all that data with relatively cheap hardware, right? Your your laptop can do machine learning. So that that's kind of just amazing. So now I want to go over some basic machine learning terminology. Um, the first term we're going to talk about is a model. And you can think of a model as a software representation of what a machine learning system has learned. So in your mind, you already have lots of mental models. So for example, um, writing a sentence you have a mental model that tells you that the first word in the sentence has to be capitalized, the last thing in the sentence has to be some form of punctuation, and in the middle there's structure for it. There has to be a, a subject and a predicate. Right? Uh, the same thing happens for the computer. The computer under, you know, develops a set of rules on how to perform a task, and those rules are what we call the model. 
A feature can be thought of as a column in our data. They are the things that the computer can look at to make a prediction from. The label represents the answer. It's the thing we're trying to predict. So for our data set, it was the unsat, sat, or excellent ratings. Those are our labels. And an instance is a row in the data set. So for us, an instance could be thought of as one particular person's Air Force fitness test scores. And this includes the features as well as the label. So here's a small sampling of the data set we're going to be looking at. We take this, we hand it off to a machine learning algorithm, and it produces some form of model. So here is a very simplistic example of maybe if the waist is more than 40, it's unsatisfactory. If it's less than that, then we look at the runtime. The important part is that those are the features, those are the labels, right? And then here is the actual, here is an actual instance. So there are five instances four features, one label. So when we talk about machine learning algorithms, we can dump them into two giant buckets. The first one is called unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning is useful when we have an unlabeled data set. So for example, if I go back here, if I only had these columns and I didn't have the, the result, right? I would say, well, how do I find any type of pattern or relationship that I could learn? So an unsupervised learning algorithm, its job is to try to group these instances based off of their characteristics and try to find you know, if this grouping is useful or not. Right? So for example, I could take uh, push-ups and the runtime and I could graph them for all the users and maybe I get something like this. And just by looking at it with my eye, I, I see that there are three natural clusterings, right? Here's a cluster, here's a cluster, and here's a cluster. And there are algorithms that can actually go and determine if there are actual clusters. So they can determine that those are the clusters. So here's an example of how that might be done. So here, if you go to um, the website, and I'll show you the link in a second, um, it, it's up here, but I also have it in the slides. Uh, you see some data that's randomly distributed. The, what the algorithms basically do is they place some random dots throughout the screen, and what they'll do is they'll try to measure the distance between every dot and every uh, and these big dots, and they'll say whichever one's the closest, I'll color it that. So here, we'd say, oh look, you know, this dot is closest to this one, so it's red, and it these for blue and this for green. And what it'll do is once it's done coloring them all, then it'll say, okay, I'm going to find the midpoint of these, and that's where the the centroid is, so it moves over here. So now I actually build my three clusters, right? And you can actually see it um, with some other examples. So here, for example, um, uh, actually, why don't I go density bars? So here, it's not really obvious to me where the clusters are. I can't see it, but the computer can do the same thing, right? It can guess some clusters and it can keep doing it until, as it goes through, you can see it's going at every iteration, it's trying to figure out which dots actually belong to it. And if we do this for enough time, eventually the dots won't move and you will see the natural clusters form. So this is very cool, right? It's, it's very interesting to see how it can find these clusters, but what do these clusters actually mean? And that's where human expertise is needed. So in this example, a human being would have to look and say, well, if you don't do a lot of push-ups and you run really slowly, then that's probably unsat. And this is probably satisfactory. And this is probably excellent. Uh, but it does take some intuition on the part of a human being in order to uh, interpret these clusters and, and draw some meaning out of them. But when you don't have any, uh, you know, when you don't have any labels, this is a useful technique for just saying, what, what does the data look like? How is it distributed? How does it relate to each other? The next form of uh, machine learning algorithm is supervised learning. And here we actually have labeled data set. And what we're trying to do here is identify the relationships between the features that allow me to predict the label. So, you know, by only looking at this, can I predict this? The video that I had you guys watch uh, talked about a seven step process. Uh, we're gonna combine steps one and two, uh, but it's the ge that general process is going to be the focus for the rest of this lecture. The first step in the machine learning process is actually uh, gathering and preparing your data. It seems trivial, but it's actually the most important and overlooked step. And without data, you don't have machine learning. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what information do we need to collect and how are we actually going to collect that data. 
For this video, what I did was I got a random sampling of Air Force fitness test scores, and then I actually went and generated these labels. Well, actually, I didn't. I assigned it to uh, CS110 students, so I had them go and manually label each score and decide if it was an unsat, excellent, or satisfactory. So that's how we can do it on a small scale. How does a company do it when they want to build a very big or complicated system? So here's one real-world example. For those of you who haven't seen this, this is one of the early prototypes of when the Microsoft Connect was being brought to market. So here the guy is just moving around and the system is generating a skeletal structure. Um, it's really impressive the way that it's able to uh, tell where all the body parts are. But it didn't just do it on its own, right? It needed lots of training data. So how did they build it? So what Microsoft did was they got raw imagery from the Connect camera. That's this over here, this gray image. And what they had was they got people to go ahead and color all the parts of the body that they wanted it to detect. And using these colors, they fed this, this is their labeled data, they fed it to their machine learning algorithm, and their algorithm was able to determine where all of the body parts are. And you see here that they did it with one person, they did it with two, they actually had to think of all the possible situations Connect might be in. So they had to practice in situations where there's a bunch of people on the couch, where there's a family, where there's only one person, a small apartment. Think about all those scenarios. So when you look at the combination of all the pictures that they took in order to create a robust system, it's actually impressive and scary at the same time, right? So this was a quick collage put together by the Microsoft research team to show you just how many pictures it took to train Connect. Um, literally millions, right? And you know, it's easy, it looks easy and cool when it's all done, um, but it took a lot of work. So in addition to uh, you know, getting your information, you need to figure out how you're going to organize it. So for example, if I only train the machine learning algorithm on um, uh, for Connect, let's say I'm only training it when one person's in the view, that means the system will be really good at when one person's in the room, but it won't be good when there are 10 people in the room, right? Uh, so in order to do that, we have to have, we need to develop data sets that represent a good uh, smattering of all the situations that the system might expect to see in the real world. So when we do this, we are de actually developing what we call a train and evaluate test set. So the training test uh, data set is what we use to uh, develop the model, to teach the machine learning algorithm what to do. The evaluate is a data set that we keep to the side and we only show it at the end, and this is how we can make sure that the model will work on data that it's never seen before. So, for example, for our uh, instance, we have all of this data here. We'll take maybe 80% of it and say, this is information that the algorithm can use to train on, to learn from, and then the last 20% we will reserve to show it at the very end so that we can protect how well it's actually going to work when it sees a situation that it's never seen before. So it's actually pretty easy to gather and prepare your data in Weka. Once we have our spreadsheet, our labeled data set, uh, we can go ahead and quickly load it into Weka. So when you turn on Weka for the first time, you're going to get this window, and we're going to hit the Explorer. Everything we're doing today can be done through the Explorer window. And then to load our data set, all we're going to do is open our file. I'm going to go scroll all the way to the top. Um, this is where I have the data set stored. Uh, you can get it off the Canvas webpage, uh, but it's a CSV file, so I have to go down here, pick CSV, and then I'm going to go here and download this one here. This is the Air Force Fitness Test initial file. And then here's our data set. It's already loaded for us. And then we can go over here to classify. And then here, this is where we're going to create our training and test data set. So one way we could do it is we could actually go into the data set and highlight 20% of the data and make two separate files. But Weka makes it really easy. All I have to do is uh, go over here and hit percentage split, and I say 80. And that means that 80% of my data will be used for training, and then the other 20% 20, 20 will be used in my evaluation data set. So now that we have gathered and prepared our data, the next thing we need to do is choose a model. And this one is a little bit more art than science, because there are hundreds of possible machine learning algorithms that we could choose from. Uh, but what ends up happening is that picking the right algorithm oftentimes requires you to understand something about the problem and have maybe just a little bit of intuition. Uh, so for example, if I was looking at this data set and I said I wanted to differentiate between uh, uh, blue squares and red circles, 
I might look at all these algorithms and say, hey, a linear algorithm would be really good for cutting this data into uh, two pieces so that I can differentiate between the blue stuff and the red stuff. Uh, what ends up happening a lot of time, though, is that uh, algorithms that shouldn't work well end up working really well. So although I'd love to tell you it's you know, the exact science, here's a recipe you can follow, what ends up happening is we have to try it out a couple times and see which one works out for us. So choosing a model is really easy in Weka. What we can do over here is go to the classifier and pick the choose button and then we can look at all these different algorithms and for the purposes of this discussion i'm just going to go and use the same j48 one that we did on the other class um, but we have it here so now we have our data set and now we have our algorithm all right the next phase of the machine learning process is to actually train our model so this is the phase where we're going to give the data to the model and let it learn and what happens differs for every algorithm, but conceptually, here's what's going on. What Basically, what's going on is that the algorithm is looking at all the features in our data and trying to guess the label. And when it does that, it produces some sort of, let's say, line, uh, some sort of function that tries to differentiate between this and that, all right, the blue squares and the red circles. And what the algorithm is doing is it, it examines its guess, and then it compares it to the actual answer. So it will look at it and say, oh, man, I didn't separate it at all. And then the algorithm goes back, it adjusts itself, and then it guesses again. And then it generates, in this case, a new line. And it does this over and over and over. And each time, it's calculating the error, and it keeps doing it until the error is minimized. And eventually, it gets a line that kind of works pretty well. All right? So how every algorithm does this is, you know, it differs. But in Weka, it's all the same. Because all you have to do here is say, all I want to do is I want to, this is the thing I want to classify. It's the field called result. If you remember for our data set, result represented unsat, excellent, or satisfactory. And I can go ahead and press play. And there it is. I trained the algorithm, and I can see my accuracy over here. All right. Now we're going to evaluate the model. And in this phase, what we're trying to do is test the data, uh, the model against data it's never seen before. So our idea is to get a sense of how well the model performs in the real world, in situations that it wasn't explicitly trained against. All right? And we want to make sure that the model has learned the concept rather than memorize the specific questions that we asked it during the training phase. All right? So what will happen is you'll see um, if we were to train it on itself, it would have very high accuracy. And then when we use the evaluation data set, we'll get slightly lower accuracy. So in Weka, all that happened uh, kind of automatically. When I told it up here to do the percentage split, it trained it. So this is this is the result of the training over here. And then this is the actual result when it tested it against the evaluation data set. So um, we want to know where the algorithm do works really well and where it succeeds and fails. And to do that, we look at what's called the confusion matrix. And a confusion matrix is literally just a little table that uh, specifies, you know, tells the difference between what was predicted and what the actual value is. So for example here, 168 instances in our data set were successfully predicted as unsatisfactory scores when they were actually unsatisfactory. 23 were predicted as being excellent when they were actually excellent, and 146 were predicted as being satisfactory when they were actually satisfactory. So these green boxes here represent all the times when our algorithm was correct, where it worked against, it worked, it gave the correct answer for data it's never seen before. The ones that are on the periphery here, these represent instances where the algorithm didn't work, right? So here was an instance where it was classified as satisfactory but it was actually unsatisfactory. So when we look at this, we can actually say to ourselves, how is, why is it that this isn't working? And if we were going into this in more in depth, if we were taking a machine learning class, we would actually go and look at every single line and we would say to ourselves, how is it that we can actually improve that? How can we remove this error? So if I go to Weka, you can actually see it down here. This is your confusion matrix. This is the predicted. This is the, uh, the actual values. So it's the same exact val values as I showed you on the slide. So when we look at this, we say, how is it that we can actually make it better? Well, why don't we use, just spend a minute, and why don't we take a look at the tree that was generated? Oh, man, look at that. If I was to look at this tree, it looks like it's learned a lot, but... Oftentimes when we look at trees that are very, very complicated, this is a sign that it's memorizing the specific questions to the test. It's overfitting. It has so many rules 
this clearly there aren't that's this many rules to understand how the air force fitness test works right we just know this from our own intuition so there's clearly not enough in the data for the algorithm to tease out what it is that makes um, something an excellent a satisfactory or an unsatisfactory so what we would do at this point is we would actually go back to our data set and see if there is there any way that we can you know help it out one thing that we could do is instead of just putting the raw scores we could actually tell them the component score right so 40 inches on your waist is worth so many points on the test so what i did here was i actually went ahead and did that i said all right here's your waist here's the component score for the waist here's the push-up here's the push-up score here's the sit-up here's the sit-up score here's the run in time here's the run score and i actually also went and made another feature where i added up all the scores so this is what we call feature engineering where we're looking at these features and saying, well, what other information can I add? What other features can I add to my data set to give the machine learning algorithm more to work with? So I actually went and produced that. And that's that, um, I will go back to pre-process. And that's the uh, AFPFT final file. If you were to open that one up, that actually has all those component scores and the sum of the score right there. So we're gonna go back here and you see here it's 96% accuracy. We're going to do everything the same. We're going to use the same 80-20 split. We're going to go ahead. We're, the only thing we have now is more features, right? More things that the algorithm can learn. So when I press here, start, wow, that's 100%. <laughs> Let's see what the tree looks like. This is interesting. So this surprisingly looks a lot like what we would expect, right? So here we see that when it's less than 75 points, it's an unsatisfactory. When it's less than 89.9, it's a satisfactory. And when it's greater than 89.9, it's an excellent. So you can see here, this tree is very simple, but simple is sometimes good. Simple means that it learned a general rule as opposed to the previous tree, which tried to remember every single answer to every single question it ends up not being very good at situations that it's never seen before. Here is a nice simple tree that works 100% of the time. And if for those of you who don't know, this is the actual score uh, thresholds of the Air Force Fitness Test, and we never taught that explicitly to the algorithm. It was through the features that it figured it out itself. So this process of going back, looking at the confusion matrix, trying to add more features, trying to help out the algorithm, this happens over and over and over and until we eventually get a model that we like. And then we proceed on to the next phase, which is tuning. So this is where we're going to adjust the settings on the machine learning algorithm to see if we can get just a little bit more performance. If we were to go back to Weka for just a quick second, you would see these values here. 0.25 m2 and actually if I go and click here you can see all these parameters that you can change and for the purpose of this class we really never go and change these but this is where if I was Tesla and I was working on a multi-million dollar system and I had you know 99% accuracy and I wanted to eke out just 99.1 would make a big deal this is where I could go and try to adjust things to see if I can improve the algorithm a little bit more but it requires an understanding of what these all these parameters do and every algorithm has its own, so it takes a lot of work to do. But here, this is, like I said, in tuning, we're tweaking the performance of our algorithm. So uh, every algorithm has its own parameters, maybe how many, um, how many times you show the training data to the algorithm to let it learn, maybe the learning rate, so how much you allow the algorithm to change it every time it makes a mistake. So if we go back to our line example, how big the line can jump could be thought of as a learning rate. So smaller jumps means that it takes longer for it to learn, but it'll be more precise. Bigger jumps means it'll be faster to learn, but it may jump over. It may, you may never get to that, that perfect line that you're looking for. So again, the more we tweak it, the more we can get to what we want. And finally, when we go through all this process, we produce a model that we're fairly confident does is going to do okay in the real world. We actually go ahead and go to the prediction phase and this is where we actually deploy the model with real data and we see how it does the point is that we can't do all those other steps give us the confidence that this model is going to work in our world or at least if it doesn't work we'll know that up front we'll have a good idea that you know this model works you know 70 percent of the time and you know you need to understand that before you deploy it um, if we're smart we'll actually find a way to collect this real world data and then bring it back so that we have more training data. And that's actually how Tesla does it. So here's an example of 
test, you know, when they are training a Tesla car, what they're actually doing is recording what the user is doing as he drives the car. So what's happening is that the Tesla model is determining what it would do if it was driving the car, and then it compares it to what the user is actually doing, and it treats the user's data as the labeled data. So in this way, the as the user drives, they're actually providing the data that Tesla can use to retrain their model and make it even smarter. If you've noticed anything from this whole process, it's that machine learning is definitely not a set it and forget it process. On the contrary, humans are involved at nearly every step, especially when it comes to, you know, things like how are we going to collect that data? How are we going to set up our training regimen so that we're not introducing an implicit bias? So for example, if I made a data set for the Air Force fitness test, but I only included uh, excellent scores, you know, individuals who got an excellent, when I train my model, the only thing the model is going to know how to predict is excellent, because it never saw an example of what an unsatisfactory or satisfactory person you know, was. There's also the challenge of making sure that the trained model isn't learning something weird. So for example, let's say that I put blood type as a feature in our Air Force data, and I found out that people with a B positive blood type tended to get an excellent more often. That's a cool fact, or like a correlation, but it, not necessarily important or relevant to the problem. The computer doesn't know the difference, so it's up to the human beings to be able to look at the trained model and say whether or not that makes sense. And that goes back to our validating the model, making sure that it, you know, it actually is learning the concept that we want to learn, and not some ancillary detail. So, we've done everything. Uh, we've been through the entire lesson. Uh, you all now understand the concept of machine learning. You're able to talk about terms like model, instance, and feature intelligently. Uh, we know the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. Specifically, that supervised learning, we have labeled data, and unsupervised learning, we have unlabeled. We don't have any labels on our data. And then, we're gonna we talked about the steps involved in training a machine learning model. Um, you are actually going to get an opportunity to practice this on the lab. So uh, for the lab, you're going to be doing a data set with tic-tac-toe, and you're going to train a model that can detect if X won the game or if it didn't. Uh, and you will have, uh, we will guide you through those steps. But it's basically the same thing we just did. I just showed you. And finally, we showed you how to look at a confusion matrix and use that as a way to gauge where the algorithm is, the, the final trained model is strong and weak. And we can use that to kind of figure out what more training data or what do we need to change in our training data so that we can improve accuracy. So I hope this has been an interesting lesson. Uh, obviously, we went through a lot, so if you have any questions, let us know. But uh, Machine learning is a very exciting uh, prospect. We're doing a lot of it in the Department of Defense, and you're definitely going to see more of it in your Air Force career. So take care, do your homework, and uh, we'll see you next lesson. Right. Bye!